The program, of course, is focused on Citizens United, and while much of the nation has focused on its impact on our democracy generally, a relatively few have focused on the potentially dramatic impact it has on judicial elections. And as Adam says, 34 of our states elect uh, judges of their highest courts, another five elect a large number of judges. Uh, in New York, we elect 73% of our judges of courts of record. Happily, not the judges of the Court of Appeals, our highest court. Thus, while we have vigorously contested primaries and general elections for many judicial offices in our state um, at the trial level, uh, we have happily no statewide judicial elections. Now, the disturbing role of campaign contributions in judicial elections has long been a subject of debate within the bench and the bar. And according to a New York State Commission, nine of 10 registered voters believe it is vital for judges to be independent from political party leaders and campaign contributors. But Citizens United has taken the threat to judicial independence to an entirely different level. And that's why we are so fortunate this evening to have this extraordinary panel with us. And I thought as moderator, I would briefly set the table for some of the issues that will come before us. As you know, Hugh Caperton, who's sitting to my left, was the successful plaintiff in Caperton v. A.T. Massey Cole in the United States Supreme Court in 2009. Uh, there, a five to to four decision held that the Constitution's due process clause required the disqualification of the West Virginia Supreme Court judge who cast the deciding vote in Caperton's litigation against the coal company, where the CEO of the coal company had contributed $3 million, principally in independent expenditures, to defeat a sitting judge of that court and elect the new member of that court, who, as fate would have it, cast the deciding vote in favor of the Massey Company. Uh, Justice Kennedy was the decisive vote in the Supreme Court and wrote the opinion for the majority. And last year, it was the same Justice Kennedy casting the deciding vote and writing the opinion in Citizens United, which found that restrictions on corporate independent expenditures, as distinguished from contributions to the candidates' campaigns, violated the First Amendment. And then later last year, three sitting justices of the Iowa Supreme Court faced what were usually routine, quiet retention elections the electorate can simply vote up or down on judges at the end of their uh, specified terms. The prior year, each of the three had joined in a unanimous decision finding that a state statute limiting marriage to a man and woman violated Iowa's Equal Protection Clause. And then for the first time in that state's history and in the wake of Citizens United, Independent expenditures played a substantial role in the defeat of the three judges. And then last month, a federal district court judge in Virginia extended Citizens United to invalidate restrictions on corporate contributions directly to candidates, not just independent expenditures, a decision that will be repealed. Now this evening we'll have an opportunity to hear the compelling experience of Mr. Caperton, both prior to and following the Supreme Court decision in his favor, and the experience of former Chief Judge Turnus in the travesty that took place last year in Iowa. And we are so fortunate to have with us one of the nation's most thoughtful journalists, Dalia Lithwick, who covers the Supreme Court for Slate and has written widely about these very decisions and their impact on the independence of the judiciary. After each make their presentation, I hope we'll have an opportunity for some interchange among the panel, and then for questions from the audience, and people will be handing out question cards for those of you who wish to pose a question. I hope we will have the opportunity to focus on some of the remedies available in states which do elect judges in terms of state disclosure requirements, recusal rules, including the proposed 151, Rule 151, soon to be implemented in New York, the possibilities of moving to merit selection systems, among other remedies. With that, it gives me great pleasure to uh, turn to our first speaker, Hugh Caperton.
Thank you, Vicki. Uh, good evening. Thank you all for coming. I want to thank the Brennan Center for Justice and the New York chapter of the American Constitution Society and the Fund for Modern Courts for inviting me to participate on such a distinguished panel this evening. The Brennan Center has uh, been so supportive of my case, and they've given, me, they've given so much of their resources to my endeavor. So I have a very soft spot in my heart for uh, the Brennan Center and the great people that work there. I and my family owe them a deep, uh, a deep uh, debt of gratitude uh, for, for all the work they've done for me. The 14th Amendment to the Constitution grants every citizen the right to due process of the law, a fair trial and a fair tribunal. It doesn't say some citizens, or citizens with lots of money, or citizens who support special interest groups that are spending millions on judicial elections. It says every citizen. Imagine that for almost nine years, you've been involved in a court battle with one of the nation's largest coal companies whose fraudulent acts and tortious interference led to the destruction of your company. A company that took over 10 years to build and brought hundreds of jobs to an area of the country that sorely needed them. After years of delays, motions, pre-trial hearings, depositions, and a trial that lasted over seven weeks in which a jury of your peers found in your favor, you were finally sitting in front of the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals hoping that after all these years, justice will finally be served. Now imagine looking up and sitting on the bench is a justice that has been the beneficiary of one individual's $3 million spending spree in his election just a few years before that. That individual was the CEO of the coal company you have battled for those nine years. During the hearing, that justice never asks a question. He never says a word. <clears throat> when it comes time for oral arguments, your attorney stands and starts to speak. And as he does, another of the justices rises from his chair and proceeds to leave the bench. He will not return to the bench until your attorneys have concluded their arguments. Later that night, that justice and the CEO exchange personal emails. Three months later, photographs are made public of that same CEO and justice vacationing together on the French Riviera while your case is pending before the court. Now, I know this sounds like a John Grisham novel, <laughs> and it really does, but in fact, this is reality. This is exactly what happened to me, and I'm here to tell you that the feeling for me, as I watched and listened to the oral arguments that day, can only be described in one word, sickening. It's a feeling that no citizen should ever have to endure in any court in this country. The court voted three to two to reverse the lower court's decision in our case. It used a form selection clause in a coal supply contract that the defendant was not a party to, had tortiously <coughs> interfered with, and had never abided by in good faith as grounds to reverse. I waited nine years to have my case against Massey Energy heard before the court. And before my attorneys even stood up to make their oral arguments, I knew that two of the five justices had already made up their minds. The actions of Chief Justice Robin Davis made it clear where the third vote would come from. She completely ignored the briefs that had been filed by the parties and instead focused her questions on forum selection, an issue so insignificant to the appellant's argument that they devoted <coughs> one entire sentence to the subject in their 90-page brief filed with the court. Although bitterly disappointed, none of us were surprised when the court overturned the jury's decision. The three justices who made up the majority were Justice Brent Benjamin, the recipient of Massey CEO Don Blankenship's personal $3 million direct and indirect campaign contributions to his election, Justice Spike Maynard, who accompanied Blankenship on vacation to Monaco, and Chief Justice Davis, who in violation of the Code of Judicial Conduct was publicly supporting Justice Maynard's re-election campaign. Writing for the majority, Chief Justice Davis said the following, quote, we wish to make it perfectly clear that the facts of this case demonstrate that Massey's conduct warranted the type of judgment rendered in this case. However, no matter how sympathetic the facts are or how egregious the conduct, we simply cannot compromise the law in order to reach a result that clearly appears to be justified. In other words, the jury got it right. 
The majority then proceeded to change the court's standard for review on a motion to dismiss for improper venue from an abuse of discretion standard to a de novo standard review by the Supreme Court. By retroactively applying this new standard, the Supreme Court reversed the lower court's denial of the defendant's motion to dismiss, which had been ruled on seven years prior to the Supreme Court hearing this case. The majority then turned its attention to the forum selection laws that had been on the books in West Virginia for nearly 100 years. They threw those out and authored eight new forum selection laws. Again, the court applied these laws retroactively. It was the first time in West Virginia's 148-year history that forum selection had been used to overturn a jury verdict. The majority, the, excuse me, the majority then dismissed my case with prejudice, completely ignoring the rules of appeal that specifically state that a case can only be dismissed with prejudice on the merits. Justice Margaret Workman, in her dissent of the third opinion, which was the same as the first opinion, quoted, remarkably, in every instance that existing law and long-standing precedent stood in the way of the result reached by the majority, it simply altered the law accordingly, unquote. Now, we went through the same song and dance in the West Virginia Supreme Court two more times with the same result. Incredibly, our second appearance in the court was in front of a panel of justices that included Justice Benjamin, who was acting as Chief Justice, and two replacement justices which he had appointed. This was after we had twice asked for Justice Benjamin to disqualify himself in our proceedings. Justice Benjamin's failure to recuse himself ultimately led to Caperton v. Massey going all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States, where it became a landmark decision that has forever changed the way campaign contributions affect judicial recusals. And although Caperton was a tremendous victory in the eyes of all of us who advocate for fairness in our judicial system, it had no bearing on the outcome of my case. And the reason it didn't was because the damage to the West Virginia court had already been done. One man had succeeded in taming the entire court. Former Justice Larry Starcher said it best when he said that Blankenship had created a cancer in the court. And that cancer was created when big money was introduced into Justice Benjamin's campaign by what the new politics report issued by Justice of State last year refers to as super spenders. Nearly $2 million of Blankenship's money was contributed to a 527 organization in the three months leading up to the judicial election. The name of the 527 was And for the Sake of Our Kids. And I'm sure Don chose that name because And for the Sake of Don Blankenship and Massey Energy wouldn't have had quite the impact. <laughs> And for the sake of our kids, spent millions on advertisements that adopted the all-too-familiar tactic used by so many of these groups who target a particular judge or justice in a judicial election. And that is that the judge was soft on crime and letting child rapists go free. Well, let's be clear, and I think we all know this. Don Blankenship did not spend $3 million of his own money on the and for the sake of our kids and other independent expenditures because of his concern for the well-being of the children of West Virginia. And he certainly didn't spend that money because he wanted a fair and balanced court. He did it to influence a vote that ultimately led to his company being granted a $75 million get-out-of-jail-free card. And this is what makes the issue of big money influencing elections so difficult for the ordinary citizen, the reasonable person. It appears that justice is indeed for sale. A little over a year ago, an explosion at Massey's Upper Big Branch Mine killed 29 coal miners. Most of those miners were from my hometown, and the tragedy was, has brought unimaginable grief to the families, the friends, and our entire, and our entire community. Two weeks ago, the governor's independent in investigation panel that was tasked with determining the cause of the explosion released their report to the public. Their findings came as little surprise to anyone in our industry. It found that the disaster was man-made and preventable had Massey followed basic, well-tested, historically proven safety procedures. Massey had adopted an autocratic uh, corporate culture mm -hmm. in which top executives led by Don Blankenship were making nearly all of the lower and mid-management level decisions. And those decisions placed profits over the safety of their miners. 
The independent panel in their report cites Caperton v. Massey as the prime example of how Massey and Blankenship, through, their, through the influencing of politicians and judges, instilled an air of intimidation over mining inspectors as well as politicians and state administrators that made it difficult for them to do their jobs without fear of reprisal. It was this corporate, co corporate culture that contributed to the deaths of these mines. And it was the same corporate culture that allowed CEO, their CEO to buy a Supreme Court justice who would twice cast a deciding vote in Massey's favor in our case. Now, it's my belief that this philosophy also exists within special interest groups who target judicial candidates. Intimidation and influence. Intimidate by distorting judicial records and influence judicial elections by spending obscene amounts of money on them. Now I'm here tonight, not here tonight because I'm a judge or a legal scholar or one of the leading appellate attorneys in the country. I'm not a legal expert. So I can't sit here tonight and tell you what the best remedy is for solving this issue of special interest spending that continues to create havoc on judicial elections throughout our country. Whether it be public financing, merit-based appointments, adopting tough, tougher recusal standard rules, or all of the above. Why I am here is because I'm a citizen who has experienced firsthand the devastation and destruction that big money campaign donations are causing in judicial elections and ultimately on our courts. It is absolutely imperative that we come together and do everything in our power to stop this insidious practice that continues to erode public confidence in our courts. Thank you.
quotes from our opinion. Notwithstanding the fact that the court's ruling did not affect religious beliefs or practices, substantial opposition to retention of the three justices on the ballot the following year, just last fall, came from individuals and groups who believed the court's decision had violated God's law or natural law. Through an effort called Project Jeremiah, preachers were urged to use their pulpits to advocate for a no vote on retention of the justices, notwithstanding that such action might jeopardize the church's tax-exempt status. Churches were so involved in the election that some of them applied for and were allowed to become pre-election satellite voting sites. As a result, voting booths were set up in church vestibules of these approved sites so members of the congregation could vote while they attended services. Now, this sounds like a grassroots mobilization of opponents of same-sex marriage, but in reality, the impetus for this, the fundraising, the media campaign, and the organization uh, that was brought to bear against the retention of the justices was anything but grassroots. The primary leader of the campaign against retention was a Mississippi group affiliated with the American Family Association. And they were joined by Washington, D.C.-based Family Research Council, Arizona-based Alliance Defense Fund, Georgia-based Faith and Freedom Coalition, and New Jersey-based National Organization for Marriage. According to AFA, its stated purpose in ousting the three justices was to send a message, quote, in Iowa and across the country that the ruling class ignores the people at its peril. This mission uh, was reflected in the demonizing and misleading nature of its campaign. For example, and I was interested in the Fund for Children or whatever. AFA called its Iowa program, Iowa for Freedom. And I agree with the person who wrote a letter to the editor who commented on the misleading nature of this name. This uh, writer said, Iowa for Freedom is not from Iowa and it is not for freedom. <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless, its campaign rhetoric struck a chord with Iowans who were upset with the court's Barnum decision. And I want to spend just a tiny bit of time talking about what that campaign message was. This group's local spokesperson argued, quote, <coughs> appointed judges are dictating from the bench which societal beliefs are acceptable and which ones are not. But he claimed the retention election was not about gay marriage. It was about liberty. Asserting the court legislated from the bench, he said, if they will do this for marriage, all your liberties are up for grabs. And I'll give you an example of how that message was reinforced in their media campaign. In a television ad sponsored by Iowa for Freedom, the National Organization for Marriage, and the Campaign for Working Families, the narrator told the viewers, quote, if they can redefine marriage, none of the freedoms we hold dear are safe from judicial activism. And these words were spoken as images of parents, Boy Scouts, hunters, and flag-saluting children were shown on the screen. In reality, the Iowa Supreme Court took away no one's liberties or freedoms in the Barnum decision. To the contrary, the civil rights of same-sex couples to the secular benefits that flow from the civil contract of marriage were upheld, while the religious freedom of individuals and religious institutions to define the religious institution of marriage as only between one man and one woman was expressly preserved. So what was the response to these inaccurate and demonizing attacks on the judiciary? I think I can accurately sum it up by saying too little, too late. As for the three justices, ourselves, we decided early on not to form campaign committees and not to engage in any fundraising. We did not want to contribute to the politicization of the judiciary in Iowa by campaigning like politicians, even if it meant losing our jobs. Our hope was that the Bar Association and others interested in this uh, issue would come to our aid. And they did, but not with the bigger organization or political savvy that was required to counteract the emotionally laden and factually inaccurate television ads paid for by these out-of-state interest groups that ran incessantly for the three months prior to the election. Our supporters permitted our opponents, who were extremely well organized and well funded, to defend.
define the issue as one of voting for liberty and freedom over activist judges. And in the end, out-of-state special interest groups opposing same-sex marriage spent, I think, the figures are now over a million dollars in the Iowa retention election, significantly outspending groups supporting the justices on the retention ballot. One leader of the campaign against retention declared after the election, Iowa voters had done, quote, God's will by standing up to the three judges who would try to redefine God's institution. And I can't think of anything more uh, inaccurate in its characterization of the Barney decision. I have a few uh, observations based on what I witnessed in Iowa that I want to share before I give the microphone over to the next speaker. Money to unseat judges who make politically unpopular decisions is plentiful. In fact, the groups who were successful in Iowa have vowed they will not stop with the removal of three justices from the Iowa Supreme Court. They bring a substantial national organization and highly developed strategy into campaigns against judges, and that will require judges on the ballot who are targeted to raise significant funds to counteract these attacks. And what does that mean for the future? I think certainly in the elections that are targeted by these special interest groups, those elections will become totally politicized, as was my last contention election. And the Iowa experience shows that a merit selection system, such as the Missouri plan, does not prevent that from happening. Retention elections can be hijacked by groups intent on undermining the independence of the judiciary as easily as any other type of judicial election. On the other hand, I don't believe that every election across the United States is going to be uh, politicized from here on out, but I don't take any solace in that fact at all. The bigger concern here, I think, is what these incidents of influence and intimidation mean for our system of justice over time. We should be less worried about someone like myself losing their position <coughs> on the court and more concerned about the future of, of our court as an institution that serves as a foundation for our democracy. My fear is that efforts to imitate, intimidate, and influence the judiciary will, over time, destroy the ability and willingness of judges to do their duty as faithful guardians of the Constitution and will result in the election or selection only of judges willing to be warriors in service to a particular ideology. And let me explain. America's justice system is based on the rule of law, a process of governing by laws that are applied fairly and uniformly to all persons. Because the same rules are applied in the same manner to everyone, the rule of law protects the social, civil, political, and economic rights of all citizens, not just the rights of the most vociferous, the most organized, the most popular, or the most powerful. Applying the rule of law is the sum and substance of the work of the courts. When judges make decisions based on who they will please or displease, or whether they will be retained or re-elected, we cease to be a nation governed by the rule of law. The politicization of judicial elections encourages that kind of decision making, and that does not bode well for the future. If judges act like politicians to get on the bench or to keep their uh, position, or decide cases like politicians or theologians in robes, courts will eventually and justifiably lose their credibility with the people. And I think when that happens that our society and our democracy are in serious trouble. It's my view that it's the responsibility of this generation of Americans, of everybody in this room, to support and advocate for a judiciary with integrity, one free from politics and political elections, free from intimidation by special interest groups, and free from the influence of campaign contributions. Only if we as a society have an unwavering commitment to an independent judiciary can we assure future generations that they too will enjoy a society governed by the rule of law and not by the agendas of those individuals and groups willing to use their resources to influence and intimidate the judiciary. At the end of the day, the debate about the politicization of judicial elections boils down to a very simple question. What kind of justice system do Americans want? 
one in which courts issue rulings based upon public opinion polls, campaign contributions, and political intimidation, or one in which courts issue impartial rulings based on the rule of law. If it's the latter, and I hope it is, then we need to support systems of judicial selection and retention that produce decision making rooted in the rule of law. Citizens United. 
I can say I was one of those delusional idiots who thought that having come out of Cambridge and heard Justice Kennedy's passionate, passionate belief that we need to preserve the integrity of public office and that it does compromise public office if the American public believe that you have been bought and paid for. I was one of the dopes who walked into Citizen United the, the re-argument, even knowing it was being re-argued and even knowing uh, that it could be decided much more uh, easily the term before. I was one of the people who said, there is no way that Justice Kennedy can square his vision of the judiciary that he put forth in Caperton with his vision of, of the, the necessity of, of uh, the lack of corruption in our political system. So I'm here to tell you I was wrong. Um, and, that, and that in fact, uh, you know, just uh, I want to commend to you, this entire publication is really excellent. Um, that, that I think is available. Is it available for sale or for some? We had a couple copies here, but it's available uh, for sale. Okay. So this is this is one of the first really rigorous thinks on uh, the effect of Citizen United. And I want to just commend to you, uh, Bert Newborn has a piece in which he, he writes, um, Justice Kennedy recognized in Caperton that a judge's gratitude for past favors and hope for future ones created uh, an unacceptably high risk of bias. Why elected judges are vulnerable to such quote, corruption, but elected legislative and executive officials are immune is a mystery known only to the court's majority. So the, the, the rationale that, that it was so easy for Kennedy to apply to judges because he understands judges in Hughes' case then does not get applied to other elected officials in Citizens United. And I just want to highlight two things that Adam said that are so important. This isn't just a bargain of public trust that the American public needs to believe, that judges are different, that they don't answer to the person who pays the highest uh, money for their services. It's something that judges want, too. And that overwhelmingly, polls show that judges are as committed to the principle that money, not e either, as Adam says, does influence their decisions in about 50% of the cases, but overwhelmingly that there's the appearance of bias when they are having to dial for dollars before an election. So if judges don't want a system where justice is for sale, and litigants don't want a system where justice is for sale, the question becomes who does want this system? Who does this serve? And I think Hugh Caperton is here to tell you exactly who it serves. It's not you and me. And it's something that we want to, we want to worry about. So I want to just end by saying that, that I think Americans understand the proposition that the judicial branch is different, and the justices are more than just elected officials in robes. And I think they understand that because the polling shows, again, overwhelmingly, how anxious they are about the proposition of millions and millions and millions of dollars going into judicial elections. And the poll that I saw was the 2009 USA Today poll that found that 89% of respondents believe that campaign contributions uh, on judicial elections influences the outcome in the courtroom. If 89% of Americans believe that their judges should not be bought and paid for, why are we buying and paying for judges? Why are we condoning what is a one-way ratchet, a system that is not going to get better? This isn't changing for the better. States that, that have very, very expensive elections, judicial elections, are not suddenly going to have less expensive judicial elections next year. So the ratchet goes one way, and it goes one way exponentially. And the final thing that I want to say is, and I think this is so very important, is that at the heart of this, there is a conversation we are not having in this country, and that conversation is what do judges do, and how does it differ from what elected officials do. And because we are not having that conversation, we are having a mockery of that conversation, insofar as we say, oh, justice is just called balls and strikes, or you know, Clarence Thomas, they, they strip down naked like a runner. That's not what justices do. What justices do is very complicated. I think Justice Turnus tried to explain what justices do. They try to, to, through a process, apply the rule of law. But if we are going to have that conversation 
about what judges and justices do in cartoonish terms, in 30-second attack ads, in which every judge in America, and trust me, every judge in America can be called someone who is soft on crime, who has released someone on a technicality, and who hates children and freedom. Every <laughs> single judge in America, at some point in their record, hates children is in soft on crime. Those are not useful conversations. They are sad, impoverished conversations about what the justice system does. And I hope you all took note of the op-ed in the Washington Post on Monday that suggested that we're having a very, very zealous and useful and informative conversation about the judiciary around judicial elections. Nothing could be further from the truth. So the first thing I think, the real objective that I urge you uh, to take into your own thinking about this is how to teach Americans. How do we talk meaningfully about what, ju what judges do, how they're different from elected officials, and why it is that a 30-second attack ad that says that they hate freedom and children is not a fruitful or useful conversation. So thank you very much.